believe would be made the righteousness of God by faith in Him. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray and ask all of these things. Amen. Amen. At this time, we're going to have our call to worship. So we want to look at our prayer list together just for a moment. Uh, but before that, we actually have a praise in our congregation this morning. Uh, Jacob and Chelsea, I, I know I picked on Jacob last week, and I'm just so sorry about that right now. But Jacob, Chelsea, can I pick on y'all again? Could y'all just stand up? These two got engaged over the weekend. And uh, yeah, amen. Amen. I know that y'all's families are excited about the joining of you two together in holy matrimony. And I'm just saying I'm free this weekend if y'all need a quick wedding. So uh, just, just putting that out there. So, but yes, well, uh, we'll be praying for y'all. Encourage the congregation to do the same. Also, in addition to our prayer list, we have the uh, Jimmy Dale Davis family, Annette Thomas, Glenda Miller, Marilyn Laird, uh, Mr. Wayne Stringer, Kay Smith, Bubby Pittman, who is doing much better. Also, Greg Lee, Miss Jan's brother, as well as Dolly Smith, uh, Linda Miller family, Fran, uh, Miss Fran Ginn, and then Hilda Davis has been moved back up to the top of the prayer list. Uh, just had a uh, pacemaker put in. So, along with these prayer requests, do you have any unspoken needs that we can pray for? Okay, well, we'd love to pray for you. Um, brother Ben Mitchell upstairs, would you lead us in a word of prayer for these requests?
let's start that over. Let's start that one over and try it again. Hope everybody got over the little hole. Hey, Amen. Well, they're awake now, that's for sure. <laughs> Test one, two. walking through the music aisle at Walmart, checking out the CDs, or you're going to be scrolling through iTunes, and you're going to see the name Blair Pounds under the Christian section, and somewhere on the bottom of that track list, probably like the 14th or 15th number, the songs that nobody really listens to, there's going to be a featuring there, Evan Sheridan, and that's going to be my rap portion, so there you go, Blair, that was, that was Beautiful. I'm so glad that we restarted that so y'all could hear that. That was incredible. Why don't y'all uh, bow with me for a word of prayer? Lord, we thank you again for this day. Already it's been a great time to be in your house, among your people, about to open up your word, where it's all about you. Thank you. Lord, as we look into your word now, be with us. Help us to study. Once again, just asking that you would help us to have eyes that see and ears that hear. Help me to communicate your text as I ought to do so. Knowing that we only do any of this by the grace and the power of the cross. Thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, we are continuing our suffering and joyful series this morning. Uh, it's been about four or five weeks since we've been in the book of Philippians, so I do want to give us some reminder, background information for us this morning, just to paint the picture for what we are going to be 
uh, looking at. And so if you have your copy of God's Word, you can go ahead and turn it over to Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to read today verses 12 through 18. But the sermon, the focus of today's message is going to be on verses 17 and 18. So as you turn there, let me, let me paint this picture for you for the city of Philippi to which these, this letter is written. The city of Philippi, in many ways, is like America. We see uh, Philippi's origins and actually being named after Philip of Macedonia, who conquered Philippi from the Thracians uh, several uh, hundred years ago now. And what happens is, well, Thracians had control of this area, followed by Philip of Macedonia, to which he renames the city after himself, Philippi. Uh, Philip, I mentioned in one of our previous sermons, was the guy who had aspirations to conquer the world, and yet he died at an early age. He couldn't quite uh, conquer the known world, but his son, Alexander the Great, went on to conquer the known Greek world at that time. So Philippi is... Uh, you know, the, named after the father of Alexander the Great, for those of you who care about that kind of stuff. And then a little bit later in history, Philippi is actually conquered by the Romans, who bring it into Roman sub, uh, uh, subjection, right? And so what we have entering into Paul's time in the uh, Philippian church, or, the, or in Philippi, is we have a city that is multicultural. You have elements of Thracians, you have elements of Greeks, and you have elements of Romans there, primarily those three cultures of people. You have a multi-language city. Archaeologists have found coins and inscriptions and pieces of pottery with all the different languages, of even going back to Thracians. You have a multi-religional uh, city, and I know that's not a word, but there are multi, there's a bunch of different religions in the city of Philippi. Going all the way back once again to the Thracians, they found Thracian temples to gods and goddesses of the hunt and wine and so on and so forth. You also have the Greek pantheon in Philippi. You have the Roman pantheon in Philippi. You have a very small Jewish influence in Philippi at the time of Paul and Silas entering into the city. And so we see a city that is uh, multicultural, multi religional, right? Multi-language, and it's a very diverse and large city. In fact, it's one of the chief cities for the Roman province of which it is stationed in. In fact, between uh, Philip's conquering of Philippi and the Roman conquering of Philippi, you see Philippi kind of slip off into history. It becomes less prominent, but then the Romans come in. When they conquer, they revive the city by basically letting all their soldiers uh, retire there. So it's got a very strong Roman flavor to it. Like I said before, it's a small Jewish influence when we see Paul and Silas come into Philippi in Acts chapter 16. And there's something unique about this church. There's something that uh, we might not would, and certainly the writers of the New Testament might not would expect that came from the birth of the church. But usually when the Apostle Paul would enter into a city for the first time, he would wait until the Sabbath and go to the synagogue, and he would preach the gospel of Christ at that synagogue. Now, according to Old Testament law, or according to Jewish law, a synagogue was only formed when there were ten Jewish heads of households present within that city. But there was no synagogue in the city of Philippi. That's how small the Jewish presence was there. So when there was no synagogue, the Jews would actually go to the river on Sabbath, and they would worship God there. So on the Sabbath day, we see Paul goes to the river, and there he meets a God-fearing woman named Lydia. He shares the gospel with Lydia. She responds in faith, and she gives her heart and life to Christ. We see her whole household responds in turn as well, and they all repent of their sin, and they are all baptized in the name of the Lord. And right then and there, we have the founding of the Philippian church. A God-fearing woman named Lydia, and she's thought to be very wealthy. She is a, a seller of, uh, let me find it here, of purple cloth from the city of Thyatira. Purple cloth is a very uh, expensive product back in that time period, and purple, of course, representing the royalty. 
So we have the church is kind of birthed from this God-fearing woman named Lydia. Soon after that, Paul and Silas, they're walking down the road in a, uh, a slave girl who is basically able to foresee the future is kind of uh, following them, right? And she said, uh, these men who are proclaiming, this is coming out of Acts 16, you don't have to turn there, but just listen. As she followed Paul and us, she cried out, these men who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation are the servants of the Most High God. And she did this for many days. Now the CSB in the next verse says, Paul was greatly annoyed. I don't know why Paul would be annoyed at that, but that's what it says. And turning to the Spirit, he said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out right away. When her owners realized that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities, bringing, before, bringing them before the chief magistrates. And they said, these men are seriously disturbing our city. They are Jews and are promoting customs that are not legal for us as Romans to adopt our practice. The crowd joined in the attack against them, and the chief magistrates stripped off their clothes and ordered them to be beaten with rods. So, so far we see Lydia is converted, we see a slave girl is saved, and now we see Paul and Silas beaten for their faith in this marketplace. They are cast into prison, and they begin singing. And I can't help but wonder if they're singing the fourth verse of It Is Well, right about the time of midnight, whenever there's an earthquake that comes through the area by the way of the Lord, all these prison doors are busted open. All these shackles fall off. This prison guard who's responsible for keeping all these prisoners in check sees what has happened. He is getting ready to take his own life by way of the sword when Paul and Silas step out from their cell and says, Wait, we're still here. Long story short, this jail guard, this prison guard, comes to faith in Christ. His whole household follows suit. They all repent of their sin. They place their faith in Christ and they're baptized in the name of the Lord. And bada bing, bada boom, here we have the birth of the Philippian church in this multicultural, multi language, multi religional city. What a unique birth! What a unique place! And then we turn to Philippians chapter 2, and this is probably about 15, 20 years down the road. The church has grown. They've got a reputation for being a sacrificial, giving, loving church. This is a church that is near and dear to the Apostle Paul's, Apostle Paul's heart. And he's going to write to them in this section of Philippians chapter 2, basically a code of conduct for their life. To which we're going to read, starting now, Philippians chapter 2 starting in verse 12, going all the way to 18. He says, Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you, both to will and to work, according to his good purpose. Verse 14. Do everything without grumbling and arguing, so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world by holding fast or holding firm to the word of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. That was the last sermon we had in Philippians. Verse 17, but even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. If you're a note taker and you like to take notes, let me give to you this sermon title. You can take this note. The sermon title is A Sacrificial Life. And my goal for this morning is to help us evaluate whether our lives for those of us who are in Christ, whether our lives are actually sacrificial or if they are selfish. The takeaway for this morning's text is this. The sacrificial faith of the Philippians and of Paul 
serves as an example to us today to be people who joyfully, joyfully being a key word there, sacrifice for others for the sake of the faith. We look now in verse 17. But even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. The first thing we see of the sacrificial life is it pours itself out for the sake of the faith. It pours itself out for the sake of the faith. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be up front with you this morning. Uh, this is probably the most important point of the whole sermon. Okay, so if you could just lock in with me for ten, uh, five, ten minutes here, and we can get through this first point together, I'll I'll give you permission to take a nap afterwards. Okay, but anyways, uh, the first point, of course, the sacrificial life pours itself out for the sake of the faith. I want to say something to you this morning. I want to read a verse of scripture, two verses coming out of First Corinthians chapter six. Verses 19 and 20, Paul writes the words to the Corinthian church. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? He says to these Corinthian believers, you are not your own. You are not your own, for you were bought at a price, that price being the blood of Christ upon the cross. And so he says, so glorify God with your body. This may come as a startling reality to you this morning. I certainly hope it doesn't, but it may come to you as a startle. Uh, If you are in Christ, so if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you call yourself a Christian, you proclaim you have faith, then you belong to Christ. No longer a slave to your sin, but now you are a servant of God. He is the King, the Lord, the Master, the boss. He gives us stewardship over the things we see, yes, but obedience is still expected for the believer in Christ. He doesn't just save us so we can continue to live our lives as we please. He saves us for His purposes. He saves us for His glory. He saves us so that He would make us ambassadors for the gospel. He saves us so that we would live a sacrificial life. And one of those things we've been commanded to do as believers is to love one another sacrificially, to love others sacrificially for the faith. See, the Apostle Paul uses this terminology here. He says, poured out as a drink offering in verse 17. And this is a unique phrase. It's only found in one other place in the New Testament. And that's in 2 Timothy, where Paul is writing to Timothy at the end of his life. And he is saying, I have been poured out as a drink offering. Now I've run the race. I am just about finished. Apostle Paul saying, I am in the bottom of the ninth. And this phrase is poured out as a drink offering. It's a reference to the sacrificial system for Jews and also for some Greek religions as well. See, what, would, what they would do is uh, in this system is, of course, you would have the primary sacrifice being the meat or the animal. But as a complimentary sacrifice, uh, we'll get more, we'll touch more on that complimentary thing in just a second. But they would take a sweet smelling wine, nine times out of ten, and they would pour it over the flames of this sacrifice. And what would happen is a sweet aroma would uh, ascend up to the heavens and thus pleasing the Lord. We see that Jews do this. We also see that some Greek religions copied it from the Jews. I think they copied it from the Jews. But it's this idea of pouring yourself out. It's this idea that we give all that we've got. And we see that in the life of Paul. He is 110% committed to making disciples, to proclaiming the gospel, to building and edifying and planting churches all over the world, or all over his region, wherever he is called to go. And he's this pouring out that he's referencing to, it's, it's him using imagery that they would understand in their time and their context. Now, I know none of us are building fires and pouring wine over those fires, right? But within their context, the Jews and the Greeks reading this letter would have understood, hey, he's talking about you're taking something valuable, you're taking something sweet, and you're giving all that you've got of it to this service, to this sacrifice. That's what Paul is calling his people here in Philippians to do.
And I think that no one can argue against the fact that Paul gave his all for the cause of Christ. Church history tells us that Paul is martyred. He's uh, most likely beheaded while he's in Rome, Roman imprisonment. By the way, he writes the Philippian letter from Roman imprisonment. So we have from Paul an example to live sacrificial lives. And my question for us this morning as we look to applying this text to our lives is what is our commitment in this room to the cause of Christ? What is the level of our commitment here? And don't get me wrong, I'm so glad that you're here this morning. I'm so glad to look out and see your you're, uh, some of you have bewildered faces, and that's okay. Uh, I'm probably looking a little bewildered myself, but uh, I'm, I'm so glad that you're here. But is your commitment to Christ going to be found outside of a Sunday morning worship service? I don't mean that harshly, but I want you to evaluate. When people gaze upon your life, and I'm even asking the question for myself, when they gaze upon my life, do they see someone who is giving it their all for Christ? giving their all for the sake of the gospel, giving their all so that others would hear the good news and turn from their sin and turn to Christ. It's no secret that numbers in Southern Baptist churches have been uh, in decline across the board. Dr. Jerry Watts pointed that out to us last week, and that was a, a faithful reminder from him. And those numbers have been in decline for several years now. And I, I, this week, as I struggled with this message, as I, as I wrestled with it, I couldn't help but think, why is that, that we are so in decline, almost seemingly across the board? Baptism down, church membership down, discipleship down, attendance is down. Why is that? And there's a multitude of reasons, maybe one could say, but, but I kind of have it set in my mind, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, and please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, after the service, out in the parking lot, we can fight about it, right? But I'm convinced that the primary reason why those numbers are down across the board is because the church, capital C, church in America, has lost her zeal for sharing the gospel and for making disciples. Church programs often are no longer focused on winning the lost, but rather now on getting and keeping the saved. Churches are more interested in building buildings rather than making disciples. And even among Christian families, I've noticed that there is a zeal to have families involved in every activity under the sun, but yet we neglect spiritual things such as Bible study, such as prayer in our homes. And certainly, if we're not praying or doing Bible study in our homes, we can almost guarantee that there is no evangelism happening outside of the home. Friday afternoon as I sat upstairs, we were in Jackson for a wedding. I was doing sermon prep upstairs by myself, and as I was, I was writing these words and I was singing about this, I couldn't help but be brought to tears as I thought about my own zeal for the lost. Where is it? And I know that some of you are soul winners for Christ, and I applaud you, and I pray for you, and I thank God for you. But every believer in Christ has been called to be a soul winner for Christ. From preachers, pastors, Sunday school teachers, and everybody else in between. Jesus said it very plainly. In the book of Matthew, he says, In the last days, the love of many would grow cold. Think how sad is it that the words he spoke may be true of our churches today. Where is our zeal for reaching the lost? Where is our zeal for evangelism? Where is our zeal for sharing the gospel? Let me tell you where I think the blame lies. I don't blame you. I blame me. I blame a generation of pastors and preachers who, for whatever reason, 
had the best intentions of proclaiming the gospel here behind the pulpit, but failed to teach their people how to share the gospel outside of it. Things must change. We got to change that. We got to do better than that. I speak for myself there. But regardless, we see that Paul's example to us as a believer in Christ is one of who has poured out everything he has for the sake of the church so that people would come to know the Lord, so that the church would be built up and edified, so that people would be drawn nearer to God. And he gives his life for this cause. Not only that, but we also see the sacrificial life sees itself as secondary for the sake of the faith. That's the second point sees itself as secondary for the sake of the faith. We see in the second part of verse 17, uh, let me just read 17 again. But even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. If we are diligent to live a sacrificial life for the sake of the church, then there is a danger of our sacrifices becoming about us rather than for the sake of the church. Paul's use of the language, going back to drink offering there, is important here because it gives us the Apostle Paul's perspective on his ministry to the Philippian church. He sees their service. He sees their ministry as being the primary sacrificial service. His service to them was secondary. It was complementary. That's why a drink offering was poured over the flames. The drink offering was not the sacrifice. It was part of the sacrifice. The service to the church was never about Him. And is the same for each of us as well. Our service, our spiritual gifts the Lord gives to us, they're not ultimately about us. They're about church. Our goals, our gifts, our skill set, from those who teach Sunday school to those who stand behind the pulpit to those who do everything behind the scenes, none of it is ultimately about us and about some sort of recognition that we can get. It is all about the Lord Jesus. It's all about His church. Paul recognizes that the work of the church is not built upon what he does is not based upon any one individual. The work of the church is the primary work and that work is only accomplished by the power of God working amongst them. So we see that the sacrificial life sees itself as secondary or complementary for the sake of the faith. We don't serve the church so others can look at us and see how great we are. We serve the church so that God would be glorified, so that God would be honored. Much to my wife's, uh, sometimes you're entertained, I guess. We've been listening to Lord of the Rings on Audible as we drive around, as we uh, you know, go places, especially as we drive to Jackson. We like to turn on Lord of the Rings, right? Yes, okay. And uh, we just got to the part in the second book where Frodo, Sam, and, and Smeagol are trying to get into Mordor. And if you don't understand any of this, I'm so sorry. But uh, Smeagol is a character in Lord of the Rings who is basically uh, corrupted by this piece of jewelry that holds a lot of power over a lot of different people. And he has this inner struggle within him the whole time. He's got this Smeagol side of him that wants to do what is right and what is good. And then he's got this Gollum side of him that wants the, evil, the, the ring for himself to do evil. And as I was listening this weekend as we were uh, driving in, I thought to myself, you know, I've always, I've always pictured myself as more of a Frodo, right? The hero of the story? No, we're more like Gollum. No, we have this inner struggle where we want to do things that please and glorify the Lord, but we also want to do things that bring honor and glory to ourselves. And that's the part of living in this world of the flesh, right? But regardless, I mean, if we're going to live sacrificial lives, and we have to do so in a way that it's not about us, it's not about our sacrifices, it's about the kingdom, it's about the church, it's about Jesus. And finally, what we see, I bet you didn't think you were going to be told your golem this morning. Congratulations, that was for free. All right, next up, uh, the third point we see in today's text is this, the sacrificial life. Not only does it pour itself out for the sake of the faith, not only does it see itself as secondary for the sake of the faith, but it also rejoices 
as it sacrifices for the sake of the faith. Paul says at the end of verse 17, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. You would think that a man writing from Roman imprisonment wouldn't have an ounce of joy within his heart and soul. You think he would be down in the dumps about his situation. You think he'd be down in the dumps regarding in this letter to the Philippians. And yet he says, I rejoice in these things. And he rejoices with the Philippians as God does this work amongst them. He rejoices in the fact that his work isn't even primary. It is secondary to the work of the church. He rejoices in all of these things. The sacrificial life rejoices for the sake of the faith. And this is the primary theme that we see throughout the whole book of Philippians. That Paul, even though he's in Roman imprisonment, writes to the Philippian church with joy in his heart, even despite his situation. That's kind of the whole point of this series. Learning how we can be uh, suffering and yet also joyful. Paul counted it as a joy and urged them to rejoice with him in their own service. And I want to tell you something this morning. We have as people an honor and a privilege to be able to serve Jesus within his church. This is not something that we have to do, although we are called to obey. We're called to walk in obedience to the Lord. But it's not just that. It's something that we get to do. You know, like every morning when I wake up, I think, man, I get to walk the dogs. Does anybody get excited about walking a dog? Anybody? No. Me neither. That's something I get. I have to do. But when it comes to the work of the church, we get to say, I get to serve the church. I get to preach the gospel. My Sunday school teachers, you get to teach the word of God. My soul winners, you get to share the gospel. My sound team, my musicians, you get to use those gifts for the work of the Lord. Those are things that you can rejoice in, that you can serve in. My people who serve behind the scenes and so many times you go unrecognized, you get to do that. I'm so thankful for you. The church is so thankful for you. And yet sometimes we serve begrudgingly with bitterness in our hearts and murmurings on our lips. Well, I think we ought to be able to rejoice that God counts us as blessed to be able to sacrifice for the sake of the faith. Would you consider a moment your position when you are outside of Christ? And maybe if you are still outside of Christ, would you consider your position as a sinner? Unable to earn your way into heaven? Unable to, no matter how many good deeds you're able to do, never be able to do enough that earns your way into heaven? Do you know, like, when you are outside of Christ... You were condemned for your sin. You're on the highway to hell. I mean, we think about our positions outside of Christ when we were outside of Him, and it's a bleak one, is it not? And yet Jesus saves us. By His grace and His mercy, He calls us into this relationship with God the Father by His blood, by faith in Him. And now, because of this, we get to serve Him joyfully. A people who do not deserve such a thing, all of a sudden we are redeemed, we are made into the righteousness of God, and He calls us to obedience to Him. And that's something we get to do. So in conclusion, the sacrificial life, it pours itself out for the sake of the faith. It sees itself as secondary for the sake of the faith. It's not about us. And it rejoices as it sacrifices for the sake of the faith. Now I want to ask you this morning, just plain and simple, where is your heart at? Why do you serve? Do you serve? And you know where you stand. You know where you stand better than I know where you stand. All I'm going to ask this morning is that you respond as God will lead you to respond. Maybe that means making a profession of faith for the first time. Maybe you recognize that you are far, far outside of Christ and you need to repent of your sin and you need to trust in Him for salvation. You need to do that right here, right now. I'll be down front. You can come and talk to me. I'll be, I'd love to pray for you, pray with you, pray over you. Maybe you're a believer in Christ who is just kind of caught up in the ways of the world right now. Willing to sacrifice for any and everything except maybe for the church. You know what you need to do there. Repent of that 
and start looking for ways to serve. And if you need help trying to figure out how to serve, we got a bunch of people here who know what, look, we can tell you what to do. You can contact us over the church officer or there are uh, opportunities that abound, I'm sure. We, can I tell you what we need, something we need at New Hope? We need a visiting ministry. We need a ministry that is willing to go out and to knock on doors and invite people to church and to love people and share the gospel with them. That's one of the things that I've kind of been burdened about here lately. We need one of those. If you're interested in serving that way, please let me know. I'll be glad to hook you up. But regardless, I'm going to ask that you do what God wants you to do in these times of invitation. I'm going to ask our musicians to come on forward. I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and then we'll have our invitation. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for the grace for the mercy, for the love that you bear for us in Christ. Lord, to be able to, to be able to sit in this room, and to be able to worship you, to be able to hear from your word, what a blessing that is. How many are sitting in their homes all across America? How many are right now, even across the globe, not getting to do these things for whatever reason, not, be, not even desiring to do these things. But Lord, we're here, and we desire to worship you. Lord, during our time of invitation, I pray, God, that you would have your way with this place. May you turn hearts and minds to respond the way you would have them to do. And we just pray that all glory and all honor would, of course, always go to Jesus. It's in his name. Amen. Please stand. Four thirteen. about us on Wednesday night where we'll have a prayer meeting for the adults in here uh, followed by a business meeting right after youth will be out in the fellowship hall still uh, just ask that you say a prayer for me this week if you think about me uh, I'm preaching a small youth camp down in Louisiana and uh, so just pray that God would move and that he would have his way with the uh, services and so on and so forth so we're looking at five sermons over the next five days and we're really excited about that so just please be in prayer for them is there any further word before we go to the house? Did I forget any announcements this morning? All right. Brother uh, Brent Slocum, would you close the sound of the word of prayer?